In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome you to our Perseverance family. And as always, we're going to start by praying to Mary. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. That's why we say a beautiful prayer. Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's turn to our spiritual director. He's also known as the counselor, the consoler. He's known as the paraclete. He's known as the gift of gifts. Another title is, he is the mutual bond of love between the Father and the Son. And as St. Paul says, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Father. So let's turn to the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier, that he'll give us a lot of light, a lot of love, a lot of peace, a lot of joy. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary, as we sing. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me. Mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, <coughs> fall afresh on me. Now in us, Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, Fill us, Use us, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us, fall afresh on us, fall afresh on us. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. St. Therese, Pray for us. St. John Bosco, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome all of you to our Perseverance family. And today, 
there's much to be said because we celebrate a Marian feast day. Here's a beautiful picture of Mary and the Magnificat. But we celebrate something that is um, atypical in the church calendar in the sense that usually we celebrate the feast day of a saint. Like yesterday, we celebrated the feast day of St. John Maria Vianney. And he would be the Curie of Arras. August 1st, we celebrated St. Alphonsus Liguri, the founder of the Redemptorists. The last day of July, we celebrated St. Ignatius of Loyola, who gave us the spiritual exercise that many of you have, have done with many blessings. But today we celebrate we celebrate a church, and the church that we celebrate is in honor of Mary. It is one of the four major basilicas in Rome. If you've ever been in Rome, there are seven hills, and there are four major basilicas in the Eternal City. Can you name them? Have any of you ever been to Rome? Do you know the four major basilicas in Rome? I'm sure you can mention one, and that would be the Basilica of St. Peter in the Vatican. Right next to that, the Holy Father has his residence in Santa Marta, where the body of St. Peter is buried. Then there is another, which is technically the seat of the Pope. It's called St. John Lateran, in honor of St. John the Baptist. The third, St. Paul outside the wall. And the fourth is the one we celebrate today in honor of Mary, the mother of God. And the name of the basilica is St. Mary Major. So I'd like to start by explaining that which is the feast day today. Then we'll go into other important activities. It also happens to be a very special day for the Oblates, and I brought to you a portrait of the founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, Venerable Father Bruno Lanteri, because that's a day in which he died today, so I'd like to talk about that also. And the readings, as always, are very rich. We're still in Jeremiah and the Gospel of St. Matthew. <clears throat> well, let's start with um, St. Mary Major, also known as Our Lady of the Snows. St. Mary Major, as we mentioned, is one of the four major basilicas in Rome. And it's the oldest basilica dedicated to Mary under the title of Mary, the Mother of God. Built in the fifth century. And this is built as a result of a major Marian victory. And it was this. In the 400s, there were a lot of problems within the church, theological, Christological heresies. And there were some that were denying the fact that Mary was the mother of God. Mary, the mother of God, of course, is the, is the principal Marian dogma. There are four Marian dogmas. 
Mary's mother of God, the perpetual virginity of Mary, her immaculate conception, and the assumption of Mary into heaven. Those are the four Marian dogmas. So these are the four Marian dogmas. This first one, Mary is mother of God, was being contested by various heretics. So a council was called, and it's called the Council of Ephesus. Which, by the way, according to tradition, after Jesus ascended into heaven, from the cross he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. And John took Mary to be, to be with him, spiritually in his heart, but also he took Mary to be with him in his home. So St. John the Evangelist was the bishop of the Church of Ephesus. You read for the book of Revelation, you have the letter of St. John to the churches of Ephesus. So there was a council in Ephesus, which is now in Greece. And after a lengthy discussion. The key figure was Saint Cyril of Alexandria and his hard work. Mary was proclaimed as the Theotokos. By Theotokos we mean Mary was and is truly the mother of God. And of all the Marian titles, Mary is the mother of God, is the most important of all Mary's privileges. So that was proclaimed dogmatically. Dogmatically means it was proclaimed officially as a truth in the Catholic Church that we have to accept. Otherwise, we cease to be Catholics. So as a result of this, there was a victory and a church was built on one of those hills in Rome. And the name of the church is in, in Italian Santa Maria Maggiore. We speak Italian, Santa Maria Maggiore. In English, we call it Saint Mary Major. And some beautiful things happen. To show that Mary was happy, of, happy with this, upon the dedication, April 5th today, in Rome, apparently it snowed. So this is also called sometimes Our Lady of the Snows. I lived in Rome for seven years. Very, very rarely does it ever snow in Rome. I was there in about 1982 and actually did snow in the middle of winter. But for it to snow, in the middle of summer is literally impossible. So Our Lady allowed it to snow, and according to tradition, they say that Mary left her footprints right there on the, the ground of the basilica. You notice before Pope Francis goes on a trip or he comes back, he'll go and kneel down in the Basilica of Our Lady, um, uh, <coughs> Our Lady St. Mary Major, giving thanks, asking for her blessing. 
In Courtney tradition, there's even some relics from Bethlehem found there. When I was a deacon, I would go to St. Mary Major. Right now you have the Dominican priests who are the custodians of St. Mary Major. In the major basilicas, you'll find priests confessing. I had my confessor there back in 1985-86, Father Horn, who was an English Dominican priest. So to make a long story short, today we want to honor Mary, the Mother of God. August is a month in which we have various Marian feast days. Actually, starting tomorrow, if you like, you can start your novena, novena, novena to Our Lady. And the celebration 10 days from today is the Assumption of Mary into Heaven, Body and Soul. A footnote here. St. Faustina Kowalska. St. Faustina Kowalska would prepare for Marian feast days by making the Venus. You know what she'd do? Nine days in a row, she would pray. A thousand Hail Marys. I've heard some Filipinos have actually done this also. A thousand Hail Marys every day for nine days. I'm not saying that you have to do that. But it's a beautiful gesture. Because every time we say the Hail Mary, Mary's heart rejoices. And every time we say the Hail Mary, every time we say the Hail Mary also, we're honoring Mary as Mother of God. What do we say in the Hail Mary? Holy Mary, Mother of God. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's celebrate today Our Lady of the Snows, St. Mary Major, Mary the Mother of God. Okay, let's move from there. I'm going to cover various mini themes today. And today, I'd like to take one verse, just one short verse from the prophet Jeremiah. And we're reading Jeremiah 31, 1 to 7. This is what the prophet Jeremiah says to the people of God and to you. He says this, With an everlasting love, with an everlasting love, or age-old love, two translations, with an everlasting love, with an age-old love, I have loved you. Let's talk briefly about that. The love of God. God is love. God the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. And the mutual love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. Of all the virtues in our spiritual love, life, love, supernatural love, we call this charity, is the greatest of all virtues. Bring this biblical passage, the essence of the first reading today, to your holy hour.
God is love. Here's the dynamic. Unless we really grasp this fundamental concept in our spiritual life, we're going to be limping in our spiritual life. We're called to fly high like an eagle. We're going to be limping. Here's the dynamic. God is love. God created you out of love. God is an infinite love for you. You must accept the love of God for yourself. Even when you fail, you fail, get up. My founder, we honor today his death and birth into heaven, says, Nunc Chepi. Nunc Chepi means when you fall, don't stay down, but get up. Even if you fall a thousand times in one day, don't stay down, but get up. Nunc Chepi. So once you accept, once you accept the, the love of God, and you are keenly aware of the fact that God loves you so much, you're aware. God is your loving Father. Think about the father of the prodigal son accepting his son, giving him a kiss, a hug, a ring, a new vestment, sandals, the party, the fatted calf. All those are manifestations of the love of God, also known as mercy. Pope St. John Paul II said, mercy is the second name for the love of God. Then once you are keenly aware of God's infinite love for you, then once you're aware of that, then you can love others. Because, my friends, we cannot give what we don't have. The response real psalm is actually taken from Jeremiah 31. And the response is, the Lord will guard us as a shepherd <clears throat> guards his flock. Lately, I've been trying to promote among our people, a careful reading and meditation of that psalm. It's a psalm which is most famous, the psalm of the Good Shepherd. Jeremiah says, the Lord will guard us as a shepherd guards his flock. <clears throat> and it's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He leads me beside restful waters. Even though I have to walk through dark valleys, I fear no evil, because you're with me, your rod and your staff. Your rod and your staff, you lead me and guide me. You anoint my head with oil. Baptism, confirmation. My cup overflows. That refers to the Eucharist. I believe that I will be in the house of the Lord. I will go to church. Enter into my own interior house, my soul. I believe I'll be in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And that means heaven. You, one day, are called to the eternal banquet, which is heaven. We should long for heaven. 
Psalm 41, verse 1. As the deer yearns for the running streams, so my soul yearns for you, O Lord our God. So the responsorial psalm refers to the Good Shepherd. Jesus is the Good Shepherd of your soul. But let's build upon that. Jesus is the Good Shepherd of your soul. But you are also called to be a good shepherd. Yes. You're a mom, you're a dad. You are called to be the good shepherd of your sheep. Your family is your flock. You're called to protect your sheep. You're called to defend them. You're called to nourish them. You're called to correct them. You're called to go after your wandering sheep. You're called to seek them out. You're called to place them on your shoulders. You're called to bring them back to the fold. You're called to love them. But this is the secret, my friends. The secret for you to be a good shepherd to your sheep, you have to be a good sheep to the good shepherd. That's the order, I repeat. For you to be a good shepherd to your sheep, you must be a good sheep of the good shepherd. So that's the first reading, the responsorial psalm. God has loved you with an age-old love. Accept the love of God so that you can give the love of God to others. The Lord will guard us as a shepherd guards his flock. God, Jesus is the good shepherd of our souls. Moms and dads and priests and bishops, we have the flock entrusted to us. And it's incumbent upon us. It's our responsibility to watch over our flock. And especially as parents and as priests, our primary responsibility is to try to bring our flock, our children, to heaven. Nothing more important than that. Okay, so given that we're trying to cover a lot today, let's move from the first reading to the gospel. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman of that district came and called out, Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not say a word in answer to her. His disciples came and asked him, Send her away, for she keeps calling after us. He said in reply, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and did him homage, saying, Lord, help me. He said in reply, It is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. She said, Please, Lord, for even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. And Jesus said to her in reply, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, this is a very, very powerful 
moment in the life of our Lord. And there are so many lessons. But most especially, this passage of this Canaanite woman, she's a model for the prayer of supplication. Model for the prayer of intercession. Model for the prayer of petition. So let's just give a summary of that passage, and I'd like to pull out some ideas for your meditation. And these can be used in your holy hour today because we're called to praise God, but also we're, pray we're called to pray for people too. Praying for people is very important, especially for our family members. So Jesus is, uh, is traveling, as always. And he's going through a pagan territory of Tyre and Sidon. And this woman, who was not, uh, not a Jewish woman, she was actually a Canaanite woman. Uh, she had heard about Jesus. And this woman had a problem. I think we can identify with this woman. She, this was a woman, a mother, with a problem. She had a problem with one of her kids. And her daughter, her daughter was being attacked by the devil. The devil does exist. We can't deny that. So this woman had probably exhausted a lot of her resources seeing how this daughter of her, hers that was suffering so much, how she, she could be liberated from this bad spirit. So this woman had most likely heard about Jesus. Possibly she even had seen him maybe from a distance. But she heard about Jesus. Okay, she heard about Jesus. So faith comes through preaching and hearing. That's why I'm preaching to you right now. We're going to grow in our faith by listening to the Word of God. But this woman, not only did she hear, but she had faith. I repeat, she had faith. Faith is a theological virtue. Three theological virtues. Faith, hope, and charity. Faith is a theological virtue in which we believe in a God that we don't see. Because if we see God in what's called the beatific vision in heaven, there's no longer faith. Faith. So Jesus Read through the Gospels. Jesus would carry out miracles. Or he would not carry out miracles, depending on one thing. Whether or not the people placed their faith in him. Times he would go to a town and he, was, he marveled at their lack of faith. Where there are other circumstances, like today, or for example, the centurion. Centurion goes to Jesus and says, my servant is very sick. Jesus says, I'll go to heal him. The centurion says, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. I'm a man of authority. I tell one to go and he goes, another come and he comes, do this and he does it. And the centurion says, 
Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus marveled at the faith of this man and his servant was healed. We even have that in the Mass now. Before receiving communion, we say, This is the Lamb of God. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant and my soul will be healed. So faith is an indispensable condition for us being healed and for God granting our request. No faith, no healing. That beautiful movie that came out a few years ago, Little Boy. Little Boy had faith. And the faith of the little boy was able to move the mountain from one place to another. Faith that can move the mountains, how true that is. So let's go deeper into this biblical passage. The woman draws close to Jesus. And in other biblical passages shows Jesus at table and she's at the feet of Jesus. So see the great humility of the woman. She says, Lord, heal my daughter. Now, the first time that she says that, Jesus does not even respond. One of our problems in prayer is the following. We ask God for something. We beg God for a request. And it seems as if the God is deaf to our appeal. Seems as if God does not hear us. So we become discouraged. We get up and we throw in the towel. We give up. This woman teaches us not to give up. So she goes after Jesus again and says, Lord, please heal my daughter. The apostles basically tell Jesus, get rid of her. She's yelling after us. And Jesus finally speaks to the woman. And Jesus says, I have come for those of the house of Israel for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She pleads to Jesus. She wants Jesus to heal her poor daughter. She's seen her daughter being tormented by this demon. And she can't bear to see her, her daughter suffer so much. Then Jesus says something very surprising. Very surprising. He says, woman, it's not right for us to throw the food of dogs to the children. Now, a dog in the time of Jesus is different than dogs today. Very often dog was just a, a street wanderer, like in the American society, we have dogs as pets. We have dog hospitals. We have dog clothes clothes. We have dog pedicures. In other words, 
you have a pet dog, it's almost as if that dog is one of your family members. And we have great love for animals. And nothing wrong with that. But in the time of Jesus, the wandering dogs, the cur, wandering the streets, was seen as an uncouth, dirty, meager, almost disrespected animal. So the fact that Jesus says that it's not right to throw the food of the children to the dogs seemed to, seemed to be somewhat demeaning. But the woman responds, <clears throat> Lord, Lord, please, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the master's table. So the woman demeans herself even more. Jesus hearing this says, Woman, great is your faith. Be done according to your faith. From that hour on, her daughter was healed. I think that's a very interesting passage because sometimes Jesus would heal by placing his hands on the person or lifting up the person. For example, the 12 year old girl that had died, Jesus goes into the room with the father, 